everyone, welcome to RBC at Home. My name is Kim Goff and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. I'm coming to you today from my home, which is located on the territories of the Lekwungen, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations here in Victoria, British Columbia. I extend my appreciation for the opportunity to live and learn on this territory. And I encourage all of you to consider the traditional territory on whose land you are on today, wherever you are. Today, I'm very excited. Uh, we have an opportunity um, today to talk with two professional opera singers. And in the summer of 2020, tenor Caden Forsberg and baritone Micah Schroeder were scheduled to participate in Pacific Opera's 40 Days of Opera, an event that was unfortunately postponed due to COVID-19. Instead, they've been spending the year as part of Music Alive's Civic Engagement Quartet. During this time, they're being mentored by artists accomplished in a variety of performing art, dis arts disciplines through the process of creation, storytelling with voice, and authentic personal connection to song. Welcome, Caden and Micah. Hello, thanks for having us. Great. Hello. Well, rather than me telling everybody about you, let's have you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and where, you, where you're from and where you are now. Caden, let's begin with you. Sure. So uh, my name is Caden Forsberg. I am an opera singer. Um, I grew up in Edmonton, Alberta. I actually did spend quite a while in Victoria. Uh, I spent about five and a half years there. I moved there to study with Benjamin Butterfield and did my master's at the University of Victoria in voice. Um, I think that's probably where I really learned to sing. <laughs> um, and then I moved to Montreal. So now I am based in Montreal. Um, although during COVID, I'm actually, I'm back at my parents' house in Edmonton, like a lot of people are. I think that's like a common <laughs> story. So um, yeah, but I, I sing, uh, I sing opera. I've been singing opera for professionally for about six years. Uh, I also sing uh, a lot of musical theater and do some just like straight theater stuff too. So um I kind of, yeah, acting and singing is kind of my uh, professional art forms or the, the ones that I am a professional in. And both of those necessary for opera. You do have to be that special combination of an actor and a singer, don't you? And Michael, what about, what, what about your background? Um, well, I grew up in Port Moody, British Columbia. Um, I did a lot of my studies in Vancouver as well at the University of British Columbia. I also studied in Toronto at the University of Toronto. Um, now I actually live in Berlin. I've been living here for about a year and a half, um, singing here as well. Um, yeah. And Michael, what first got you interested in opera? What was it that caught your attention about opera? Well, I first got into singing when I was a teenager. I, I started in band and choir um, in the music program because I wanted something to do. I needed some extracurricular activities. Um, and I really liked singing. And I don't know how good I really was when I was a teenager, but I was really excited about it. So I found a teacher to study with. Um, and I just kept, I sort of kept going and going. I didn't really know where it was going to take me, but I... I thought maybe I'll study music, I'll go to university. I thought I would apply for music education programs. And I thought I'd seen music taught at schools. I'd seen people teach singing. I thought, okay, I can do that maybe. Um, and then when I did some auditions for university programs, I got a lot of encouragement from the panels and from who I had sung for to pursue performance. And at the time I thought like, ooh, I don't know if that's for me. Like, I really like this, but I'm not, I don't really feel like someone who should be on stage. I just hadn't really had a lot of experience at that point, but. I remember I had this really um, vivid experience the first week that we, I started university and I thought I was really way, way in over my head. Um, and we were doing the opera Swore Angelica, which has no men in it really. There's just um, uh, an offstage chorus that I was singing in. So I wasn't really involved, but I was sitting in the theater one day and doing my music theory homework. And there's this really famous aria at the end of the opera, Senza Mamma, when this nun discovers that um, her, the child she had out of wedlock has actually died. And so she, she sings this beautiful piece about how he, he lived without a mother and it was a big tragedy. Um, and the singer though, she just, she was singing the aria like face down on the stage. And she, I remember just lit, hearing her voice and looking up and being totally blown away by her performance. And from this moment, I was sort of just like hooked. I looked at her and I thought that is what I gotta do. 
<laughs> so how do you go from being like, okay, I, I think I'm good at this. <laughs> um, and I'm really like, I, I am connected to this in some way to actually making it a career. Kaden, what were some of the steps you had to do? Oh man, uh, yeah, well, I, I started out also in, in like high school. Um, I was not like from a particular, like didn't have like a particularly musical past or anything. I was like forced to play piano like everybody and I hated it. Uh, and then I, but I was an athlete and I, um, I suffered some pretty bad knee injuries actually after like nine dislocations playing football. Um, I had to have a surgery and the, the surgeon just said like sports are over for you. You're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to keep playing. And so that kind of affected my life plans. Um, so I joined the like music theater program at my school, um, which again, also was sort of unexpected. It wasn't quite the like punk rock band I wanted to be in. Um, but it was really interesting. And I, and I, and so I, I, I ended up singing music theater, being in these shows, and my, my school had a really wonderful program um, where we got to work with like uh, you know professional like voice teachers and choreographers and et cetera. And and so I thought this is cool, and I think this is something I want to do. Um, but it wasn't really until like at the end of my undergrad um, where I was studying voice really and and really for the purpose of doing music theater. I was studying voice to be a music theater singer, even though I was studying classically. Um, when I moved to Victoria, I met Ben Butterfield and I moved to BC and I, it was kind of this like all or nothing thing. I just packed up, I'd met Ben in the summer at a program and I packed up everything into my car about a month later and just moved. And I thought, I'm just going to go, I'm going to go all in on this and I'm going to like really, I'm going to learn to do this right. And I'm going to give it everything and, and see if I can make a living at it. Um, which in hindsight was a pretty crazy thing to do. But uh, so far it's turning out okay. I can't speak for the future, but like for the last like six or seven years or whatever, it's been pretty good. And for the folks watching who may not be opera fans, uh, can you say a little bit about who Benjamin Butterfield is? Oh, of course. Yes. Um, Benjamin Butterfield is a, well, he's from Victoria. He's like, a, he's an institution within Victoria. <laughs> he would hate me saying that, I think. But he, he teaches at the University of Victoria. Uh, he, he's a, a wonderful tenor, wonderful singer, wonderful teacher. He's performed all over the world. Um, he, had, he, he had and has an enormous career. Uh, but then he, he leads a really, really wonderful, excellent voice program at the University of Victoria. So um, in classical music, a, a big part of when you're trying to figure out how to train is you really want a teacher. It's really still this like mentorship model where um, it's not like, I don't know, going to, a, I don't know, architecture school where you're going to go through this program and it's going to make you a good architect. Like you really need that like one-on-one -on -one time and mentorship. Um, so you you go two places usually for the teacher. That's sort of the, the general advice. Um, and so Ben is someone that I went to Victoria specifically to study with him. And uh, I mean, lots of students have, have made that same choice. Michael, who was your mentor? What was the, is there one particular um, teacher that stands out for you? Um, I don't think I would say I have one. I think maybe three big teachers for me. Um, two of which I had at school. One, um, his name is Peter Bartza. He was at the University of British Columbia. He still teaches there in Vancouver. Um, I studied with him for six years. I really learned like from, I think he really built my voice from the ground up. I mean, I had some natural talent and I, uh, some natural musicality, but I didn't really know what I was doing when I started university. Um, and then another big teacher, I worked with Wendy Nielsen, another famous renowned um, Canadian soprano who teaches at the University of Toronto. I was with her for about two, two and a half, three years. Um, and now that I'm living in Berlin, I have a new teacher, her name is Gundela Hintz. Um, she's a great German mezzo soprano. She's really um, well-versed in a lot of the German romantic repertoire. Only some of that I sing, but um, for me, I've, it's been sort of those three, three cornerstones. So what is your, it sounds like you're still, um, you still have a coach uh, in a way then, Micah. What is part of your like daily life then as, as maintaining your voice or building your voice, especially now that there aren't any um, operas <laughs> necessarily or live performances taking place? Right, well, I mean, even outside of the COVID times, most singers have a team of people, um, usually a, a core voice teacher, a couple of coaches, maybe, maybe depending on 
language specialties or something. Um, and for me during the COVID times, a lot of that has just continued. Um, since I live in Berlin and my, my main teacher lives here, I can, since when the, I guess the bubbles have allowed it, I can still go to her house and study with her um, and have coachings here as well. Um, outside of working with people, I think, I mean, most singers are usually spending probably an hour or two hours practicing every day. Um, and that practicing isn't just like singing our scales, going through repertoire that can also, um, that's also encompassing of um, a lot of the preparation work we do. Some people don't know that we spend a lot of time prepping for operas because we're often singing in a language we don't necessarily speak. Um, we have to have everything from memory. We need to know what every word means, both that we're saying and what all the characters around us are saying. Um, so there really is a lot of study that goes on um, between gigs. So sometimes it can feel like we have, even when there are gigs, we're really busy with rehearsals and all that social interaction, um, stimulation or stimulus from other people. But um, we should really spend a lot of time reading, memorizing, preparing. Right, because an opera is no small thing. <laughs> it can be a huge part. Kaden, do you want to talk a little bit about what's involved in opera, who's involved, all the all the moving parts there? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I uh, actually I, I wanted to mention one thing too that I uh, when when Mike was talking, he mentioned like this team of coaches that singers have and like all these all this work we do prepping a score. And I just wanted to say for for people who might not be familiar with it. Um, lots of times like why we have multiple coaches is you might have a coach who's really your go-to person for like French repertoire, right? Cause they're really specific about like the nuance of the language and the style. And then you might have someone really specific for like German repertoire. And then you might have someone who you just go to cause they just like absolutely kick your butt and go, what does this word mean? What is that note? And you're like, oh, I don't know, I think it's an E. And they're like, wrong, you don't know your score. So you kind of, <laughs> you have this team that, that helps you. Um, but that's, yeah, like that's all pre showing up in the rehearsal hall, right? We, as the singers, we all have a group that supports us, that helps us prepare. And then when we show up on the day, it's expected that we know our roles. We're supposed to have like total, total mastery of our, of our roles so that we can show up and really work on the production. Because as a singer, even though you might feel like it's all about you, the opera is not in fact all about you. It's about a whole story. And your job is to fit into it, to be a part of it. And um, so, man, what goes into it? There's, you show up at the rehearsal hall, there's you. There's a bunch of other singers. And that might be kind of your principal cast, all your like leading and supporting roles. Uh, depending on the show, you might have a whole chorus, right? So there's a whole group of singers that will function as the, well, all sorts of things from the nobility in a scene to peasants to a mixture of them and, and, the, and, depending on the size of the opera, there can be more or less of them. Um, you're going to have set design, right? People who've designed and people who've built the set. Uh, you have costume designers who are designing costumes for the show, who are running up to you and measuring parts of you to make sure your hats and your shirts and all that kind of stuff fit. Um, you have stage managers. And this is, I know stage manager, if you don't know what that term means, stage manager is like a technical director. They're the person who is in charge of making sure all the things and people are where and when they're supposed to be so that you have the right props that you're not walking on without your sword uh, or you have your sword and it's the wrong scene right so they're supposed to make sure that doesn't happen make sure all that lighting cues everything special effects um and then of course i would say sort of at the the top in this like hierarchical structure is then also the of course the uh, conductor and the director. And so the conductor, right, is really in control of everything musically, and the director is in control of everything dramatically. And in opera, because the music and drama are linked, the conductor and director often also need to be really, really collaborative and listening to each other and, and feeding from each other. So that's sort of the environment as a singer you walk into day one of rehearsal and then continue to work with for the, the period of, I don't know, three to six weeks, depending on the show. No small parts, right? There's, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's so many parts to make the whole thing, uh, to make the whole thing happen. You mentioned the conductor. There's, is it, is there always a live orchestra for opera? I would say mostly yes. Um, I know in music theater, you might sing with like canned music a lot more, right? Like that's uh, sometimes like touring, like even quite big touring shows might have um, mostly pre-recorded or pre-recorded with a couple live players, like a pianist and drum kit or something. Uh, but for opera, 
I think most of the time you're pretty safe to say there's a live orchestra. I, I think that would be very much the exception if there wasn't. It's part of the magic of it all, right? Is that you have everything's happening in front of you. It's all being created in the moment you're watching from the, the orchestra to the singing to the stage to all of it. It's yeah, very live. I think another really exciting part about opera that maybe some people know, some people don't know is that part of the magic is that it's all live, all acoustic, unamplified, right? Like no singers are ever amplified with microphones. There are some operas that you might see, um, for example, like a bunch of operas by John Adams. He actually writes, he wants certain singers to be amplified for certain reasons that usually doesn't only happens in modern operas, but Aside from that, generally singers are not amplified at all. So it really sh brings in this element to play where singers are sort of, we really have to train our bodies sort of like athletes to create a sound that is not only beautiful and pleasing and under our control, but also really resonant and I guess loud enough that we can actually be heard all the way at the back of the hall. So there's a lot of training to create um, a chamber in our in our mouth and our throats and our bodies with our and in our chest with our resonance resonators um, in order to make that sound. Can you give me some tips? So I often have to speak. Well, when we could have people at the museum in big groups, you're talking in front of a big group. What are some of your tips uh, to being heard, to being able to project? Um, okay, tips. I think good posture is one. Um, when we lose when we lose space in in um, at the top of our neck here at the top of our spine and we sort of crunch down here we lose a lot of space in that in in your resonance cavity in your throat when you kind of keep the 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 back of the neck and the top of the spine long we we actually gain a lot of space in the throat there mm -hmm. um, and so we end up using resonators both in the back of your throat and in the front of your um, your face cavity. So the more openness you can create, the more resonance you're kind of getting in both directions. That's a lot of technical talk, but. <laughs> but can, you yeah, any... no, that's helpful thinking about that. Posture matters. Um, you're making me think you probably also need to do some warm ups, like physical warm ups too, I imagine, with your face um, or your mouth. Yeah, I mean, Kate and I probably both do like similar warm ups. I mean, I usually do. I have a strict warm up regime that I do every day when I sing. It takes about seven or eight minutes. Um, but a lot of the stuff that I do is actually called like semi vocal occlusion. That's where the vocal cords only partially touch. But that I do lots of funny things with like a little straw, um, which make me look crazy. I actually have one right here. Do you want me to show you? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, so I, I'll, I'll take like a, a bottle with a straw in water and you like blow bubbles into it and make sound. It's like. And that. Um, <laughs> There's something about the negative, the pressure created in your mouth from the, the water and the tube makes uh, like sort of an ideal um, pressure, air pressure cavity in your mouth so that the vocal cords can touch really gently, but also fully. It's so, like yoga. It's like yoga. Yeah, it's like yoga. It's like, it's like doing like some like gentle stretch. It's like gentle, but also active. Yeah. Nice. Do you have any um, pre warm up routines that you do, Caden? Um, I actually also do like we'll sing with a straw. I've actually I've never done that into like a bottle of water before. That's I'm going to try that. But yeah, normally I'll like take a straw um, and and uh, sing like scales on it. Or if I'm let's say, I don't know, I'm on the road or something and I'm auditioning or suddenly I have to go sing something and I don't have a straw with me. Um, you can kind of accomplish the same thing by doing it on like a v, right? Just something that like makes the the space that the the air is coming from small and like slightly covered so that you're not like overblowing anything. So I'll like, yeah, you'll you'll often see me uh, before auditions and stuff in a bathroom or something going like just like nice, gentle stretching of the chords. And then being a tenor, I literally will always just sing a super high note before I have to sing, like just out of nowhere. I'll all of a sudden be like, oh. okay, good. We're good to go. That's the like tenor warm up. I have literally been in productions with Caden where at times when I'm on stage, I don't think you can hear it in the house. I can hear through the theater that Caden is in 
our dressing room singing, getting ready to sing his scene. <laughs> well, speaking of that, how did the two of you meet? Was, uh, was this your, the first time you met being part of this uh, group of Pacific Opera? No, no we, that, is a, that is a great question. Um, do you want to answer this, Caden? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, Mike and I met years ago at uh, one of Canada's, I guess, probably best and like sort of most famous, let's say, opera training programs, Opera Nuova. It's kind of something that pretty much every opera singer now in Canada has like gone through at some point, usually undergrad, masters, sometime in there. So it happens during the summer. It's actually in Edmonton, Alberta. Um, and yeah, so there's there's lots of shows. It's like a festival that goes on. So you you put on a whole bunch of productions. You put on like a dozen concerts, and you train with people, and you you have coachings, and it's it's really busy. Um, and everybody is in all these different shows. So you might be playing like a main role in one show, and then you have to be like a little role in this show, and in this role show you have to be like a very little role. So in <laughs> Micah's show where he was the main guy, I was an incredibly small role. So the show was Don Giovanni. And Michael was Don Giovanni, who is the Don Juan. He's the seductive, womanizing, terrible, terrible human being. And throughout the show, of course, you're always like, oh, he's going to get punished. He's going to get punished. And so at the end of the show, he does, in fact, get punished. Uh, a statue comes to life and damns him to hell. And demons pull him to hell. <laughs> and I was a demon. And I was just, my, I was just painted. Me and the other demons were just head to toe body paint, come crawling out on stage <laughs> and grab Micah after he sang his high note. I remember Micah very firmly being like, you cannot grab my leg <laughs> until I've sung my A or whatever that was. <laughs> and then, so we'd wait. Okay, there's the high note, grab him and pull him off. Is that is that accurate, Micah? Did I miss anything? <laughs> no, I think it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to forget meeting someone like that when they're dragging you to hell. Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> well, that sounds like a, a fun experience and a, and a highlight. I imagine there have been some terrible experiences as well. Can you share any terrible audition experiences? Hopefully not performance experiences. <laughs> well, most of the time when you get, by the time you get to the show, since everyone you're working with in professional opera, everyone's a professional. There's so many people that we've talked about that go into what getting an opera from the rehearsal stages onto the, to the stage that um, not that much goes wrong in a performance, but I've had some pretty bad auditions. I mean, Caden can probably agree with me. Auditioning is not our favorite part of our job. Um, the necessary evil. But it's a necessary evil, that's, that's correct. Um, but I, I've had a few times, like, I mean, not a few, lots of times when, you know, I go to New York for a week or something and I have auditions every day. And sometimes you have to, the auditions at like 9 a.m. And I remember one, one year I was there for like four days and I had three auditions in a row at each day at like 9, 10 a.m. And the first one I did, I went, went super well. And I was like, okay, I was nervous to sing in the morning. It's not really my favorite time to sing, but I felt like I really crushed it. And I was like, okay, next, next day, feeling so good. I walked in, I was like, I'm going to crush it. Um, and I was singing a Mozart aria and at a, Mo a lot of Mozart arias have the same sort of um, progression where there's a high note at the end. Um, sometimes it happens like twice exactly the same way. And I remember just being like so ready. And I was like, and then I was like, okay, I'm going to do it again. And then I'm like, and it just was so bad. I was so bad. And I just felt like, okay, well, they're probably not going to ask for another piece. So whatever, I'm just going to leave. <laughs> and then they were like, oh, can we hear the Jake Heggie aria? And I thought, really? Okay. So I sang my second aria, which went actually pretty well. I think I did a really good job. But I, I remember just feeling like that feeling where you're doing your driver's test and you know that you've already ran a stop sign and that you've totally failed, but they're making you do the parallel park at the end anyways. <laughs> So I didn't get that job, but <laughs> that's okay. It was a funny story. And and similarly, uh, also in New York. Um, so yeah, the com com opera companies will kind of like there's audition season in the fall, and it's everybody everybody's at New York, and you're doing all these auditions. And similarly, sometimes they're super early in the morning. And so I had one for a company that I won't name uh, in case I audition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'd run for a company, and I show up and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna sing this aria and so I'm gonna sing this Mozart aria it's one that I often start with 
it's a nice, easy start, like not an intimidating kind of opening phrase and it kind of builds up steam, right? So like, you know, smart pick, it's a little long. It's like probably five plus minutes. Um, and so it starts and I get there and I get all ready. And like the opening phrase, so you go like, Constanza, Constanza. And so the second one's the high note, right? So that's the one you want to be good on. But right, that first phrase, I walk in and go, Constanza. And I don't think I stopped cracking for the whole aria. I It felt like an eternity of just singing. And it's like, it's like there's nothing I could do. My chords just like every time they came together, they wanted to slip and crack. And so I finished this aria and I'm thinking, this is the worst experience of my entire life. And the panel is just silent for a minute. And then uh, the person running the panel just says, sounds like a rough, a rough day for you. Hey, I'm like, yeah. And they go, do you want to, do you want to do another one? And I said, you know what? No, I'll, I'll just see you next year. And they're like, okay, that's good. <laughs> Off I went. It was just sort of like, cut your losses. Out we go. I've got more auditions today. Those need to be better. <laughs> Right. At least they didn't make you parallel park as my Exactly. Crazy. They had mercy. <laughs> they were so nice. <laughs> so thank you for sharing some of those embarrassing moments. Um, <laughs> there must be some great perks, though, as well, to a, a job like this, a job in the performing arts and on stages around the world. Do you have some highlights that you'd like to share? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, there's so many wonderful things I've done. I'm going to just share two that I think uh, sort of reflect what I've loved most about um, like getting to perform and getting to do opera. One was I got to perform Gianni Schicchi on the Amalfi Coast in Italy and it was everything you would hope it would be. There was like, you know, uh, uh, lemon gelato that was fresh and Italians everywhere showing up late to your show and uh, beautiful, just like it was outdoors and you're performing, you're, you're singing an Italian opera. The, the whole thing is about being in like uh, Firenze in Florence. And I mean, we weren't quite there. We were in Naples, but um, you know, it's just, you have these, the, the history, like everything in that opera is literally around you, like the architecture and the climate and the heat. And I, I just, there was nothing like that singing, you know, your big arias, your big high notes out into the beautiful Italian night sky with the sounds of the ocean and everything. So I'd say like, that's one side I love of opera, sort of like the exotic, beautiful, like magical moments. Uh, and then the other thing is I got to do a show called Missing with uh, Pacific Opera Victoria and Vancouver City Opera. And it was about the missing and murdered indigenous women in Canada. And so it was it worked with all, all these artists and leaders and people from indigenous community and uh, Marie Clements wrote the wrote the the book on it and so on this other side then we did this opera we, we workshopped it forever we it was a long rehearsal process to to tell the story correctly and truthfully and in a way that that's safe for everybody because it's so it's so difficult and to um get to be then a part of something like that that's so contemporary and like grounded so on one hand you have kind of like the magical the ethereal the escapism and then on the other hand opera being something that's like grounded and here and now and dealing with like important issues and watching and, and feeling myself change myself grow in this as I as I become way more acquainted than I ever could have been with with some of these issues and, and watching how it can like transform communities um so that's what that would be my I guess kind of, I was going to say short answer, but it's turned into a long answer of like highlights of opera is getting to, yeah, be a part of this world that is actually incredibly diverse. It's not just one thing. Like, it's not just like really old shows that are magical. The, those exist and they're incredible, but it goes all the way into stuff that's happening now, that's being written now, that's really, really relevant. Um, so yeah, those are just two of the many, many highlights of, of what we get to do. Micah, before I come to you, I'm just going to invite folks watching if you have questions uh, or coming up to that portion. So please feel free to type them in the chat or the Zoom. Uh, well, Micah tells us about some of his highlights. Um, I think another highlight, and Caden will probably agree with me, a perk is um, because we're often traveling for work, we, we get to, you know, you go to a new city that you've never been to and you're there for, you know, anywhere from three to six weeks. Um, and you get to make your own little home there and you, you meet 
you meet people and artists that you work with on the stage um, and you get to experience this new place and this and a new company. Um, and then ideally as you work and you, and, and the years go by, you may get rehired and visit places again and again. And um, you get to, you get to engage with this sense of community um, with companies and singers and, and also with places and with land that you, and you can kind of create your own special home there. And that's something really, really magical. And it also, also, and when you're traveling, you, it's really, you start to have a real sense of gratitude for where you, where you come from and where you are. Um, and that, so that's something I'm really, really grateful for. That's, yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. And, you know, even the, um, I guess the silver lining of last year is a program like this one where you're being able to connect with many different community mentors and artists of different types, you know, maybe mm -hmm. folks that wouldn't normally be part of your year. Um, for example, I saw some of your mentors uh, listed on the Pacific Opera site. I think I saw a butch stick was listed there. I don't know, is, is that a unique experience or is that something that has happened before? I think that, um... It's, it's new, I think, now because um, people who are in these um, ensemble studio and apprenticeship programs at opera companies around the world, now the opera companies have the opportunity to engage mentoring artists and teaching artists from around the world. Um, and because people are working from their, their homes, um, their, their options and their opportunities are, are, are much more vast than they have been in the past. So, and also because of that, we've, with at Pacific Opera, we've been able to have mentors and mentorship, even kind of outside the scope of opera, which I think has been a really cool opportunity for us to get a sense of where else can we draw our creativity and like, where can we, where else can we like, how deep can we uh, root our identities as artists and where can that, where else can that come from outside of our world often that's so sort of score driven and score bound to like bring to life what's on the page. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, we do have a couple of comments here. Rebecca who's watching on Facebook said, thank you for demonstrating that exercise with the straw. I thought that was pretty neat. So maybe maybe Rebecca's got some singing chops herself and might try doing that. Um, and Sean on Facebook is saying he's just having great fun. I think he's responding to the lovely energy uh, both of you are bringing to our presentation today. Josie, who's here on Zoom, asks, Caden, do you think you wouldn't have pursued opera if you hadn't hurt your knee? Yeah, to be honest, I was... Uh like before as right before my knee got hurt my career aspirations i just really wanted to play football in university so that's what i was working toward i had like coaches and stuff that i was training with and um that was kind of the that was like the how i was orienting my life um yeah i honestly i think taking like athletics out of the picture like in a really definitive way um probably is really yeah what pushed me to be like okay I've got a ton of free time like I'm not going to practice or work out or whatever every single day after school so I need to do something um and yeah I guess that happened to be singing uh but that's the silver lining of debilitating knee injury I guess mm. yeah gotta find those silver linings right yeah. Um, there's a question here as well. Do you find that certain roles are only given to specific types of voices, such as a baritone or tenor? So I don't, Caden, have you ever sung a role, even though you're a tenor, that was maybe for somebody else or a different type of voice? No, not, not an opera. It's a, it's a little more flexible in something like music theater, right? Where most of the roles have more similar ranges. So it's more about like vocal color. Do you want something darker, a little lighter? Um, and that's where there's a lot more play between roles, but like, I couldn't sing the roles Micah sings. Like, there's just no way, um, like where they're written, you either wouldn't be able to hear me or I would sound super, super wimpy in like the big parts. Cause like the part of Micah's range, like the notes where his voice is going to like just bloom and be huge and, and glorious and exciting is a part of my range where I will not sound that way. I will sound <laughs> very middle and comfortable and not exciting. So uh, in, in opera, it's, I, I don't know. I don't think, I don't think it's controversial to say. I, I just don't think any, nobody really switches. You might switch voice type like over a career. Like maybe you're singing as a baritone for a while and then something changes in your voice. 
and all of a sudden you start to kind of lose your low notes and your top really blooms and then you might transition to become a tenor uh but there's yeah there's i i'd love to go sing don giovanni or or follow <laughs> something but like i i can't <laughs> not written for you well, there's a, a request here. Um, it's also from Josie asking, can you guys sing a favorite verse from any opera? Question mark, smiley face. Micah? I'm sure. I mean, let me think of something. Um, uh, I could sing like a line from... Uh, like avant de quitter ces lieux from yes, Faust. Do it, do it, do it. Okay, let me give myself a note though, okay? <laughs> avant de quitter ces lieux, son natal de mes aïeux, à toi, Seigneur, et roi des cieux, I think that's okay, right? Yes. Very nice. Oh. Goosebumps. I got goosebumps. So beautiful. Okay, um, now Caden has to do something to that. Okay, I'm gonna <laughs> sing. I'm gonna sing my favorite. One of my favorite things to sing. It's the very end of an aria called "Au Blanc de Cérès." from uh oh so we're both singing french Aww. oh cute so this is my favorite just because it has my favorite high c so i'm giving myself some notes <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. Often my audition starter is that aria because it ends exciting like that, but the beginning is very easy. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> smart choice, smart choice. If everyone wants to hear more of Caden and Micah singing, um, we posted some links in the chat on uh, Zoom and on Facebook that'll take you to Pacific Opera's Music, uh, music Alive. And there's a video there. Um, uh, one video featuring Micah reflecting on his grandmother's immigration stories. Uh, what's the name of that video, Micah? It's called Denkmal. And another uh, video with Caden uh, taking us through that transformation of becoming, becoming an artist. So please check those out. Yeah, you'll hear much better sound quality than you can get here on the Zoom when you're listening to that. I want to thank you both uh, so very much for joining us uh, today. And for those of you who joined us, if you joined late or you missed something and you want to go back, this has been recorded and you will find it on the Royal BC Museum's YouTube channel. So please have a look there. The museum has reopened and we are ready to welcome people back and you can find out more on our website about time tickets and exhibits. And we will be continuing this program and are related at Kids Home and at Outside for the foreseeable future. So please check the website again for more information. Next week, uh, March the 16th, I'm going to be speaking with Brian Starzmanski about the iNaturalist program in BC Parks, which is currently featured in the Pocket Gallery at the Royal BC Museum. Um, do either of you have anything you want to plug or have people check out? No. Um, yeah, check out, but check out our videos. They're really cool. We made them this fall. It was a big learning experience for both of us. Like opera is often not a digital art form. So uh, yeah, that's a, a really cool experience to be trying to do opera in the digital world. Yeah, and not only my video and Caden, Caden's video, there are also two other civic engagement quartet members. Mm -hmm. um, you can also check their videos out as well. They, they just went up. Um, they're also really amazing. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Thanks everyone who joined us today. Bye-bye. Take care of each other. <laughs>